I, I have one key point that I'd like to make for this 10 minutes, and that is that by reframing antimicrobial resistance as primarily a sustainability issue, we can understand and deal with it more effectively. So that's the, the main point that I want to make. Now, for some of you, that might seem natural, and we're here at the conference, and we're talking about uh, AMR, but um, even the fact that we're talking about AMR, I don't think is necessarily the obvious thing to talk about at a sustainability conference. Um, but also, uh, and I think it's Sally Davies who said this, who was mentioned earlier, Chief Medical Officer, describes it as a ticking time bomb and as much a threat to the UK as terrorism. Now, it's very commendable uh, to, to use that kind of strong language to get attention, especially for mainstream audience. But the issue with that kind of analogy is it leads to a certain set of consequences that one might think about, about how you therefore deal with an issue like AMR. Um, and in fact, if we were to think of it more as a sustainability issue, I would suggest that that might be very much more a more helpful way of us um, help, helping to think about what we can do to resolve the issue um, and learning from what we already have out there in terms of uh, research and understanding about sustainability. So, for example, when uh, the House of Lords report said that antibiotic resistance threatens mankind with the prospect of a return to the pre-antibiotic era, you can see that that is, and as we've heard today, just as severe as if you were to say, topsoil erosion threatens mankind with a return to the pre-soil era. Or indeed, that depletion of cheap fossil fuels threatens mankind with the prospect of a return to the pre-cheap energy era. Or indeed, that excessive release of greenhouse gases threatens mankind with the prospect of a return to the pre-Holocene era where we had a um, uh, clim climate that was not suitable for human thriving. So the point is that this is an issue that is equatable on that level of severity. Uh, and in fact, when Jared Diamond uh, was quoted to say, there are about a dozen major problems, all of them sufficiently serious, that if we solve the 11th, 11 of them, but not the 12th, potentially that 12th could do us in, and many of them has, have done for societies in the past. Um, and so I'd really like to put antimicrobial resistance firmly as one of those dozen or more major, major issues that we have. Um, and by doing that, we can start to really try to get to the root of what, what binds all these problems together, rather than seeing them as disparate issues. So, what makes antimicrobial resistance a sustainability issue? I'm just going to mention four of the ways, I'm sure you can think of many others, uh, four of the ways in which they really are equatable. So, the firstly, first one I want to point out is international cooperation. Um, and as we heard earlier, there's a lot going on in terms of driving forward an international agenda on AMR. However, um, if we look uh, at, at the effectiveness of them, some of those organizations, that could be questioned. It was only in about the 1960s that we even started to look at sustainability issues from uh, a trans-boundary perspective, as pollution and population rocketed at the same time as globalization. And thankfully, therefore, a lot of those forums for international exchange and resolution are relatively well de de developed. Um, including international standards, and I have a colleague I work with on that here. Um, however, you know, how effective are these? But nonetheless, you know, these are issues that can only be dealt with internationally. Uh, secondly, intergenerational justice. AMR, fundamentally, like all the other sustainability issues, comes down to a question of whose needs are we serving first, and how are we serving them? And bringing other generations into the room, into our decision-making, um, even the generation that's about to be born today, um, is something that really, really needs to happen. Now, there has been research in the sustainability context in general about how we promote long-term decision-making and the benefits of that, but a lot more needs to be done. It's really quite sparse still. So pooling the resources that we might use for AMR on that with other, what we know already and other sustainability issues could really drive that forward. Thirdly, Seeing the world as a dynamic system. AMR, like other sustainability issues uh, and any human issues, are about complex, dynamic systems. These issues 
and the effect of one intervention and the knock-on effects, the unintended consequences, really need to be thought through. Otherwise, it's quite possible that in trying to solve AMR, we could create another problem somewhere else. And when we are at the stage that we are, in global sustainability, pushing at the edges of the boundaries of these 12 major issues. We cannot afford to put a foot wrong in a way that could cause massive issues. We saw, for example, what happened with biofuels, um, which in many cases ended, ended up producing more carbon than they saved, for example. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is littered with examples of unintended consequences. Uh, I was in Ghana for three months working in Bui National Park. When I arrived, it was absolutely swarming with blackfly. If anyone knows blackfly, they bite you in, they like mosquitoes, but they're tiny, they can get in everywhere. We used to have to wear elastic bands while we were building the school. Um, but they said, oh, it wasn't uh, half as bad before, before the WHO came and uh, sprayed all the riverbeds to get rid of the blackfly, which, as you can guess, killed the predators of the blackfly which didn't recover in any way the same rate, so when the black fly came back, they came back tenfold. And there are many examples like that. So we have to avoid that. And by looking at all these issues together and saying, what is the common root of this, then we might be able to get some way towards solving all of them. And that brings me on to the fourth issue, is that essentially, and this has been touched on today already, and will be, I'm sure, coming forward massively. Um, I know Megan is going to be looking at this. It's all about human behavior, and specifically about consumption behavior. And if we really, really recognize and understand that, as I think we're starting to do, then we can start to make huge progression. And we can start to look at all the amazing, massive body of work that's already been done, both in sustainability uh, area and more broadly. So. Um, a few examples, I mentioned the long-term decision-making, but we have work, years of work on energy visualization, just to give you an example. Um, Sabina Pahl and her, her team working on that. What can energy visualization, how can that be used to understand visualization of effects around AMR, for example? Um, and we have body on energy consumption, a body of research going back to 1970s. Um, Second issue around communication, communication of science. How do we talk about this issue? Obviously, a lot, lot of work's been done um, by uh, Lord O'Neill, um, but what else can we do? And obviously, Ian Stewart, Alison uh, Anderson from Plymouth University doing massive uh, amounts of research in this area. What can we use from that to really bring to the AMR issue? And finally, I'd like to draw a big amount of attention to the area of marketing. Um, I'm in marketing because I recognize that marketing is a powerhouse of changing human behavior. Changing behavior within an organization and changing society's behavior. It's the nexus, it's the, it's the, the, the point uh, in between a, a company, an organization, and all its stakeholders. It does the translation. It understands, it communicates, and it has huge Consequences and unintended consequences. And there is a massive body of work within sustainable marketing, but also marketing more broadly, that can really be brought to bear. But I'd argue it's not just about bringing that to bear on the topic, it's also about really engaging organizations with their stewardship du duty that we talked about. But going further than that, how can we instill practices that serve society in the very heart of an organization? Um, and my, I do research on purpose-driven organizations, um, organizations like Unilever, but, but whole swathes of private organizations, large and small, who are starting to put societal needs first. And those kinds of organizations are, are what we need if we're going to make massive inroads in this. As we heard, this isn't just about the pills that we take when we have a fever. This is about a huge range of products that we buy on a daily basis. How do we persuade people to buy cheap food now, uh, to, to, to not buy cheap food, to buy more expensive food now, so that we can stop a potential issue in the future that sounds quite complicated, that might or might not affect future generations? This is the kind of ask that we, we have. Um, and marketing can do a massive amount to help in that way. So, in conclusion, by reframing antimicrobial resistance as primarily a sustainability issue, we can understand and deal with it more effectively. Thank you.